welcome uh, everyone and thank you for joining us for the uh, first installment of our fall uh, seminar series hosted by the Southern Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies at uh, San Fred University. This is quite exciting having a room with uh, real faces uh, and having everyone around here for a conversation and, uh, and talk. My name is Dimitri Scott, the director of the uh, Center, Center for Hellenic Studies and will be responsible for uh, moderating uh, uh, today's uh, talk. Uh, each uh, year we invite international uh, scholars working in different aspects of uh, Hellenic studies to present their research on a wide range of uh, topics uh, ranging from archaeology, classics, Byzantine Ottoman, and modern Greek history, uh, literary, cultural studies, in general, whatever falls within a very broadly defined uh, sort of uh, Hellenic studies uh, uh, umbrella. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that this event is taking place uh, at Simon Fraser University on Burnaby Mountain, on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, laid with Muslim and Pitlan peoples. Now, some housekeeping uh, before we proceed. Uh, I would like to remind uh, everyone uh, that this uh, session is uh, being recorded. If you have any questions or concerns about uh, SFU's uh, Zoom privacy and security guidelines, I would like to visit uh, the SFU IT services uh, website. Uh, as for our uh, online uh, audience, uh, if we run uh, into a technical problem, uh, we will update you in the chat. But uh, please know that this event is uh, being recorded and will be posted uh, on uh, our YouTube channel uh, at a later date. So uh, today, give me a great pleasure to welcome our uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Jake Ramsakov, uh, who is uh, this year's uh, Helen past and present local and global postdoctoral fellow. So we have him uh, with us. Uh, for, for a year. Uh, Jake uh, completed his undergraduate study at the University of uh, Chicago, where uh, the late Walter KD uh, gave him the Byzantine bar that I suspect. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, just so we remember Walter uh, for, for a moment, uh, I actually made Jake for the first time uh, as an undergraduate at the DePaul Byzantine Studies 2011 Byzantine Studies Conference. Um, and when he promptly informed me uh, that uh, he had read my thesis, the form of which eventually uh, became uh, uh, came out as a book the very next uh, year, at Walter's prompting, uh, the encounter really left me wondering if I was perhaps assigning too little by way of readings in my undergraduate uh, uh, classes. Uh, anyhow. Uh, that uh, Byzantine uh, bar took uh, uh, Jake to Harvard for his uh, doctorate, which is titled uh, Sightless Eyes, Broken Bodies, Blinding Punishment, and the Politics of Disability in Byzantium and the Medieval West. Uh, while at Harvard, Jake also had the opportunity to work as a visiting scholar at the Austrian Academy uh, of uh, Art and Sciences in uh, Indiana. He has published uh, several articles on uh, the subject of uh, uh, blinding, uplifting stuff. Uh, but also has an interest in uh, the reception of uh, Byzantium, best reflected uh, in a volume co-edited with uh, Nate Aschenbrenner titled The Invention of Byzantium in Early Modern Europe. On the very issue of uh, uh, reception, he has also produced an article titled uh, Iranus Bolt, uh, Silver Tongue, Early Byzantine Scholarship at the Intersection of Slavery, Colonialism and Crusades, which will be appearing in a, a, a collected papers volume uh, uh, very soon. Uh, Jake also writes on Balkan and uh, Bulgarian history uh, in an article in uh, Balkanistica and on the paranoid world of the 11th century retired general Kapmenos in the journal uh, Speculum. Uh, for anyone who's interested in, uh, in paranoid Byzantines, we can talk more about this uh, uh, in what follows this session uh, over, uh, over, over drinks. Uh, we're very glad to have uh, Jake at the uh, SNF Center for Hellenic Studies uh, as our 2022-23 postdoctoral fellow. And we're equally pleased to be here to listen to his talk titled A Uniquely Byzantine Punishment, Blinding, Disfigurement, and Perceptions of Cultural Difference Across the Medieval Mediterranean. And I'll pass it on to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Demetrius, for that really wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, Paul, for, for being here. Feel at home, thanks to the really warm welcome that we received. So, so thank you all. Um, someone who didn't feel really at home when he left his home country was Jacques de Villemoine. In fact, Jacques de Villemoine had a problem. 
In 1202, the French knight set sail from Venice to reconquer Jerusalem as part of Fort Crusade. But along the way, something went terribly wrong. Two years later, in 1204, refugees who escaped Constantinople told stories of harrowing devastation. For three days, the crusaders rampaged through the city. Many works of ancient art were reported on the grounds destroyed. The Crusaders even smashed the icons and burned the books that they had found in the Hagia Sophia and drank wine in the church's holy vessels. We can picture Bill Arthur standing beneath this vast dome of the Hagia Sophia as this scene of bloodshed and grapevine and destruction unfolded around him. How could this have happened? How did a crusade dedicated to reclaiming the Holy Land for Christianity end up destroying Christendom's greatest city. And most pressingly, for the Crusaders themselves, how to justify this act to an angry Pope and a skeptical audience back in the West. But Bilo Dwan had an answer. Blinded. In his account on the conquest of Constantinople, written not in Latin, but in vernacular French to ensure a wide readership, making it, in fact, the oldest surviving work of French historical prose. Villard Blanc tells how the Crusaders first diverted to Constantinople in order to avenge an unjust binding of his team ruler. Their subsequent experience of Byzantine politics was a welter of deceit, punctuated by brutal blindings. In one passage, Villard Blanc describes a scene in which the no good Byzantine emperor was betrayed by his even more. deserve to keep their lands or lose them. Modern scholars read Delarquan's condemnation as an expression of cultural distance, reflecting the unfamiliarity of Westerners with blinding as a form of punishment. Quote, blinding was a rare punishment outside the city. Quote, blinding is not really the style in which conflicts were resolved in. Well, blinding as a punishment was not unknown in the West, but it was unusual. These quotes could be multiplied. Today, though, I'd like to challenge this simple and widely repeated story of culture clash. I'll do so by drawing on aspects of my current research project, which emerges from my dissertation on blinding, mutilation, punishments, and the politics of disability in both Byzantium and the medieval West. My project uses medieval texts related to punishment alongside both archaeological evidence and the works but in only And not only is it wrong, but I'll argue that it has prevented us from seeing the more complicated and more interesting histories of affinity and exchange between East and West, revealed by a study of this gruesome but illuminating form of corporal punishment. So let's begin with a basic fact, namely that Dillard Duan didn't need to travel across the Mediterranean to encounter blinding as a form of punishment. He could have stayed home in his native France. In 1184, for instance, the English king blinded 80 prisoners in a battle in Limoges, while a biographer of a 12th century French king reports how the bad lords of France feared the king, were captured, quote, they knew the king would rip out their eyes. This biographer even praises blinding as an act of mercy, since these transgressors, quote, really deserve to be choked to death by a noose. Brunellus the donkey, the anthropomorphic hero of a 12th century satire, pretends to be working for the Pope. When a monk's dog bites off his tail, Brunellus threatens that the Pope 
will enclose the monks in their monastery. And if any of them leave, the Pope's men will gouge out their eyes. Even among the Crusaders themselves, blinding was a familiar punishment. In 1191, when Crusaders conquered Cyprus, the Byzantines, they reportedly, quote, seized as many of the Greeks as they could and had their eyes put out. And in 1210, French Crusaders reportedly blinded over 100 suspected heretics near Carcassonne in southern France. So what exactly was Peter condemning when he condemned Byzantine blinding as a great atrocity? The rest of my talk today will approach this question in three parts. The first, I'll examine two Western critiques of kinship disfigurement. One focused on social status, and the other focused on kinship. The second, I'll analyze the rhetorical construction of Le Duan's old French chronicle on the conquest of Constantinople. And third, I'll turn east to consider events from the Byzantine perspective. I'll then conclude with some broader thoughts about corporal punishment and cultural difference across the medieval Mediterranean. Pilar Duan had little love for his Byzantine neighbors. The Greeks, as he called them, were greedy, cowardly, impious, decadent, cruel, corrupt, and lazy. But above all, Greek for Pilar Duan was synonymous with treachery. Quote, never when he approach. On the one hand, we have a warrior elite that, in one classic definition of chivalry, subscribed to an ethos in which martial, aristocratic, and Christian elements were fused together. Yet the chivalry gap that apparently divided Crusaders from Byzantines was not just about battle. It was also about what happened to enemies after battle. Speaking about medieval England, but describing a situation that applies to many regions of the West, one legal historian remarked that, quote, in the two centuries after the Norman conquest of England in 1066, hardly any high-born rebel lost either life or limb. Medievalist Matthew Strickland connects this decline in mutilation to a rise in aristocratic wealth. As new lords, protected by new castles, began to control and exploit their lands more effectively, their material assets grew. These assets, in turn, could be used to purchase safety in a very fair country. So increasingly, leaders preferred to ransom their land and their captives rather than dispose of them through death or maiming. In Strickland's view, over time, these changing aims of warfare fed into new moral boundaries of mutilation. Low status captives or criminals were still subject to corporal punishment, but the bodies of the rising knightly class, and especially the bodies of the great nobles, were now inviolable. Corporal integrity was a hallmark of high status. One example. In 1124, the Count of Flanders learned that the King of England intended to blind knights who had served their lords in a war against the king. The Count of Flanders was scandalized. Quote, my lord king, you are doing something contrary to our custom in punishing by mutilation knights captured in war in service of their lord. But King Henry's reply is also instructive. Quote, my lord count, what I do is just, these men broke faith with me. Therefore, they deserve to be punished by death or mutilation. So from the 11th century onward, English and French kings increasingly chose to spare the bodies of high-born enemies. And they were under great pressures to do so as the Count of Flanders objection to the King of England shows us. Yet kings and their apologists could still insist on their right to use mutilation, even against nobles, 
A strong current of royal propaganda in England and France defended blinding and other forms of mutilation. And that reframes Willard Juan's criticism of this Byzantine practice. For although we might suspect that Dillard Duan was troubled by Byzantine blinding for the same reasons that the Count of Flanders was troubled by King Henry's use of blinding, surprisingly, when it comes to mutilation, Dillard Duan does not explicitly dwell on the issues of nobility or uh, custom that so troubled the Count. Instead, Dillard Duan hones in on specific cases of blinding in which he emphasizes kinship was at stake. And this brings us to the second part of the talk. Bilo Duan discusses Byzantine blinding on seven separate occasions in his account on the conquest of Constantinople. And on each occasion, he reminds us that the blinder and the blinded were relatives. We'll understand this with two cases of Byzantine blinding described by Bilo Duan. First, a brother who blinds his brother, and second, an emperor who blinds his son in law. Bilo Duan introduces the Byzantines into his chronicle with the case of blinding. Quote There was an emperor in Constantinople whose name was Isaac. He had a brother whose name was Alexios. This Alexios seized his own brother the emperor and put the eyes out of his head and made himself emperor through the treacherous act of which you were just told. The son of the blind emperor Isaac escapes Constantinople and goes to the Crusaders. He begs the Crusaders to unseat his uncle, who I'm going to call today, borrowing the language of the Lord wicked Alexius. He pleads with him to free his blinded father. And so the Crusaders and their Venetian allies agree to take a detour to Constantinople. Arriving before the city walls in 1203, the Crusaders bring out the captive, the escaped Byzantine prince, son of the blinded emperor, and show him to the Byzantine defenders. Behold, the Crusaders cried, your natural lord, for Alexios, the man you are obeying, sins against God and justice. You well know how disloyally he behaved to his own brother by blinding him. After the fall of Constantinople, the Crusaders in 1204, wicked Alexios is now on the run. Alexios invites one of his rivals to his camp, who's also confusingly named Alexios, but who in the rest of this talk, I'm going to call by his amazingly Byzantine nickname, Mertsuklos, which is probably a reference to his drooping unibrow. Quote, the emperor Alexios told Mertsuklos that he would welcome him as his son. Indeed, he hoped Mertsuklos would marry his daughter and become, in fact, his son. So they held discussions. At this point, Villard Juan addresses us directly with his question, quote, who of these people who commit such atrocities against one another keep their lands or lose them? So in each of the above cases, then, Villard Juan is at pains to remind us of the kinship ties between perpetrators and victims of his team blinded. Wicked Alexios blinded, quote, his own brother, and quote, in fact, his son. These are not just examples of a rebel mutilating his lord or a ruler mutilating his subject. They're also cases of a brother finding his brother, father finding his son. Time and again, Gilbert Duan reminds us the Greeks blind their kinsmen. That is why the Greeks deserve to lose their lands. So Gilbert Duan's problem with the Byzantines blinding is different from the Count of Flanders' problem with the King of England's blinding. For the Count, if you remember, blinding infringes on the status of high-born elites. For Villard Juan, the stress of his critique falls on family betrayal. And in fact, prohibitions against kinsmen blinding kinsmen have a long period history. In 806, Charlemagne forbade his sons to blind his grandsons. And Charlemagne's son and successor, Louis the Pious, nearly lost his own throne after directly disobeying his command. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle describes a king blinding his stepbrother as the most terrible event ever to occur on English soil. In Hilo Duan's own day, 
King John of England was haunted by accusations that he blinded and accidentally killed his own nephew. King Henry, you'll remember, was able to defend his actions as the Count of Clinton, but King Henry didn't blind his relatives. So to review up to this point, the mutilation of high-status opponents and their men was always a risky practice. From at least the 11th century, kings and lords had great incentives and were under great pressures to spare their enemies' lives and limbs. But it was also a practice open to conflicting interpretations. Kings like Henry I could still insist on their right to be great rebels, even if they rarely put those rights into practice. And propagandists could argue that mutilation was not just a royal right, but also a royal virtue. Yet even for kings, blinding sons and brothers was difficult to defend. Kings who blinded their kinsmen deserved to lose thrones. And as Hilary Vaughan assures us, whole people who blind their kinsmen, quote, deserve to lose their lands. So when Hilary Vaughan wanted to paint the Byzantines as fearful or cruel outsiders, he chose to stress not so much the status of who was being mutilated, but how the Byzantines disregarded the family bonds. The Villard Vaughan expressed shock at Byzantine blinding, not because the blinding itself was an alien practice to the West, and not even because Byzantines were blinding high status elites, although they were doing this too. Rather, he emphasizes how Byzantine emperors are blinding their kids. And that, everyone could agree, was a great atrocity. But what is still missing from this picture is the Byzantine perspective. So before concluding, I'd like to turn to Byzantium to ask, was Hilary Dwan right? Were Byzantine emperors blinding their kinsmen? Wicked Alexios certainly did. Yet an analysis of Byzantine blinding reveals that Wicked Alexios is something of an anomaly. Byzantine emperors had a long history of blinding their political rivals. Relatively rare in Roman antiquity, by about the year 800 or so, blinding had largely supplanted earlier forms of mutilation, such as hand cutting or nose cutting, uh, to become the main penalty for crimes of rebellion against the state. Now, in my research, I've identified no fewer than 175 individuals blinded as rebels or traitors in Byzantium between the 8th and the 15th centuries in my readings of chronicles, historiography, law, rhetoric, travel laws, advice literature, poetry, and pedagogical texts from Greek, Latin, Slavonic. Digestics. But what I do want to direct your focus to is this particular segment of the graph. The century for the years between 1000 and 1100. In this century, I found at least 31 cases of political blinding in Byzantium. The vast majority of these 31 victims of blinding between the year 1000 and 1100 were generals, aristocrats, or powerful officials. But in the following period, from 1100 to 1180, the number of blindings drops to four, possibly five. 31 in the 11th century, four or five in the 12th century. And in each of these four cases, the victim was not part of the upper military or civil elite. Rather, all four traders blinded in the 12th century were magicians or pamphleteers or people who came from low status, essentially low status backgrounds. This shift in The 11th century, there was a profound crisis in the Byzantine state as various aristocratic families battled for control of the throne. And this crisis ended around the year 1081 with the rise of a powerful general whose name was, you guessed it, Alexius. Again, everybody is named Alexius in this book. Now, this is not wicked Alexius, and this is not unibrow Alexius and Duplos, both of whom were, in fact, direct descendants of this Alexius. I'm going to call this Alexios, for the purposes of this talk, by his full name, Alexios Comeros. 
To secure his hold on power, Alexios Cornelius did something almost no conversion to afford him. He allowed his daughters to marry other Byzantine aristocrats during his lifetime. Most Byzantine rulers confined their daughters to nunneries rather than marry them to foreign or to domestic husbands. Under Alexios Komnenos, this policy changed. His daughters and nieces were married to heads of rival factions in powerful aristocratic families, weaving, weaving them together into a vast kinship network. And here you can see the personal seals of Alexios Komnenos' five daughters, seals which bear their high state titles, including the seal of his eldest daughter, Anna, one of the Santos greatest historians. So for the first time in Byzantine history, many of the empire's most powerful aristocrats were married to the emperor's daughters. Every Byzantine emperor after Alexios Pomenos, with one possible exception, was his direct descendant. And the emperor endowed this extended family of in-laws with de facto privileges, including immunity from corporal punishment. The conspiracy and rivalry, ambition and rebellion, all of these were main facts of Byzantine life during this period. One historian counts no fewer than 14 conspiracies against the throne in this Comnenian century between 1180, between 1080 rather, and 1180. Nine of these 14 conspiracies involved members of the emperor's own family. But none of them ended in blinding or mutilation. So at exactly the same time in the 12th century that the Count of Flanders over in the West is proclaiming that high status rebels should be immune from punishment. Over Byzantium, similar patterns are beginning to take shape. The Byzantine aristocracy in the 12th century was becoming more interconnected, more hereditary, and more insulated from bodily punishment. In the East, as in the West, corporal integrity was becoming a hallmark of high status. But, this trend in blindness was interrupted at the close of the 12th century. After the main line of the Comenos dynasty died out, you can see various branches of the family competed for supremacy. These competitions led to a brief but a very violent spike in instances of emperors blinding their aristocratic rivals. Now, violence between rival generals and factions is a pretty constant feature of Byzantine politics. But this violent in the late, the violence in the late 12th century had a new ingredient because now, and an incidental side effect of Alexios Komnenos' policy, all of these aristocratic rivals also happen to be closely related to This burst of blinding, as we can see up here on the graph, had already begun to fade away by the time the Fourth Crusade arrived at Constantinople. But one of its early victims was the blinded emperor Isaac II, the had blind emperor Isaac whose son fled to the West to look for support, setting in motion a chain of events that brought Willard Vaughan to Constantinople, where he noted the horror of the Byzantines, blind members of their own family. A period of anomaly received as the norm in Willard Vaughan's text, quote, these people who committed such atrocities against one another, has thus helped obscure some striking parallels between Byzantium and the Latin West in the 12th century. Our initial question, what exactly did Willard Vaughan find so terrible about the Byzantine blinding, has now led us on a long itinerary from France to Constantinople and back again. And while there's much more to say about all of these different aspects and settings, I want to conclude with two broader points. One historical, and one historiographical. First, I argue that we misunderstand Hitler's law when we take his condemnation of blinding as evidence that it was a uniquely Byzantine punishment unknown in the medieval West. A longer term perspective shows that the practice, in fact, has an extensive Western history. And this helps us reframe our reading of this important medieval author. It was the victims of blinding rather than the punishment itself that shot Hitler's blind. But we also make Gilbert Duan's misunderstandings our own when we take his rhetorical expressions, expressions of shock as an uncomplicated reflection of Byzantine reality. A comprehensive study of how Byzantine blindness developed over time 
alerts us to the changes in the composition of the papyrus for the elite. These changes present some striking features and parallel to contemporary trends in the West, even as they stem from different sources. In Byzantium, we have a top down alliance building policy in which women play a central part. In the West, we find bottom up pressures from a rising male or aristocratic class. But in both cases, bodily integrity and exemption from mutilation became key markers of high status. Thus, a study of blinding can help us remove Byzantium from what one scholar has called its habitual exceptionalism, even as it highlights distinctive features of this peculiar medieval society. Now, the issue of exceptionalism brings me to my second and more historiographical take. The medieval historian Ernst Kentorovich noted the tendency of medievalists to dismiss Byzantium as, quote, an intellectual parenthesis. Kentorovich observed how, in their desire to see medieval civilization as the origins for a united European culture, rooted in a common language, common institutions, and common religious confessions, medievalists have defined the boundaries of their fields. The example of the red line and the multiple misunderstandings around his treatment of blinding offer an illuminating case study and how such frontiers perpetuate themselves and what we lose when we fail to cross them. It's only when we expand our frame of vision to include both Byzantium and the West together do we see how punitive blinding reveals histories of power, legitimacy, and the body that show how these two societies were in fact growing more similar in their last time even as the Crusades stoked polemical expressions of difference in both Greek and Latin sources. Understanding blinding is not just a Byzantine thing, but a feature that sometimes expands rather than divides Byzantine East and Latin West, also helps us ask some new questions about the global history of politics and punishment. For instance, what is it about vision that makes blindness so powerful as a sanction of political enemies among the Christian heirs of Roman antiquity? Why is political blinding present in both Byzantium and in the Latin West, but largely absent in the Islamic successors of Rome in North Africa and in the Middle East? We can pursue this line of questioning even further. Why do some political cultures at different times across the globe develop a sustained or recurring tradition of innovation and the blinding of political enemies, while other cultures do not? For instance, to, to, just to think about polities that are roughly contemporary with middle and late Byzantium, the Ghaznavids and Khwarezmians of Iran, the Delhi Sultanate in northern India, the Celtic kingdoms of Ireland, Solomonic Ethiopia, and Inca of Peru, not shown here on this map, in addition, of course, to Latin and Hellenic Christendom, all of these have sustained traditions of political blinding. By contrast, Imperial China and just about every period, Heian and Kamakura, Japan, the Arabic speaking Islamic polities of the Near East and North Africa, and the Mongol ones, both communistic and Islamic, of Central Asia and Eastern Europe, as well as the Mexica Triple Alliance in the Americas, all of these fall into the no blinding category. Are there patterns of belief or social dynamics present in these get blinding societies that are absent from the no blinding ones? Can studying these other societies help us isolate the particular situations or types of conflicts that activated a latent propensity for blinding in Roman and Byzantine culture? There are obviously no simple answers to these questions, but as medieval Hellenists and pre modernists of all stripes discuss how to write global histories of the distant past, comparative approaches can help us redraw old boundaries and pose new questions about Byzantium's place in a wider world. Thank you. So thank you very much for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, talk uh, in the 
and the rhetorical solution and the, the visuals, which I think are, are extremely useful in this, uh, uh, in this case. Before I pass it on to, to the audience, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll start with uh, one question that comes to, to me um, about the nature of the crimes that get punished by blinding uh, in Byzantium uh, and the West. Uh, because uh, of what you're presenting, even when it comes to kin, uh, seems to be blindings at the commanding heights of, let's say, politics uh, and management of the state, uh, both in the West and uh, in the East. But uh, uh, what do legal codes tell us about who gets to lose their eyes? Uh, do you blind, let's say, a uh, uh, street urchin who steals uh, food or something like that? Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, so what's interesting in both this answer that many of the Western cultures that I've discussed here today, not all of them, is that there is no actually codified law prescribing blinding as a crime for crimes of treason against the state or political subversion, which is indeed what I was talking about. So for instance, let's take Byzantine law codes. Um, you have blinding that emerges in the Ekloga law code from the 8th century, and it gets picked up and uh, recycled in other other law codes as crimes for stealing from the altar of a church, for instance. It's sort of a de facto highest position in this um, hierarchy of mutilation penalties. Um, but that same law code, the Ecuador, which also continues the history, prescribes death for. Each one of these cases of blinding, technically, it is a sort of extraordinary commutation of destinies, right? So definitely by law, but ever intercedes to commute to blinding. So there, it doesn't really exist in the level of sort of legal um, rules. It is, in fact, always in theory extraordinary. Now, in practice, of course, it becomes so regular that it essentially becomes a cycle for crimes against the state. Um, but legally, at least, it remains separate from the types of laws that prescribe certain types of immigration penalties for certain types of crimes. And that often is the case also in the West. So there's always the level at which kind of political blind, to call it that, distinguish it from judicial blind. Let's say the blind would happen if, you know, in the farmer's law, the same thing, you steal an ox or you steal from the, from the um, altar of a, of a church. That kind of judicial blind exists at a color level. But then there's this kind of flexibility that exists up at the political level where it's never really codified, but it becomes this, this active sort of practice. It's a form of economy in a way. That's exactly uh, right. So you, this is how it's often described in, in pro-imperial Byzantine texts that are trying to apologize this word or explain why it is it seen, it, it's presented as a uh, lessening of the harshness of the laws. Uh, now, of course, there are all sorts of different perspectives. There are plenty of people in Byzantium and in the West who think that blinding is not particularly merciful. Um, but this is, this is how it's you know, presented by the state when it is essentially to justify these high standards. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank, thanks for the talk. This was really effective and fun, actually, to regard as well, not just to watch, not, not just to listen. Uh, so, uh, talking about the kind of blinding and you focusing the larger on what do we have on the Byzantine side, side from that time period? How do the sources there deal with the blinding? I'm thinking. I mean, what is this form describes the blinding of Muzuplos or Alexios the third kind of lures him into the bathhouse and like, well, let's do something and then he blinds him, right? So it is described, I don't remember exactly the words, but as a bit of a moment of treachery in itself, right? And then like Mace has the whole paranoia about the other the second, constantly blinding um, other nobles, right? Even I think one goes to Palolo, which actually tells him, well, either you flee to the Turks or you lose your eyes. So how do they describe it? And then kind of on the flip side of the coin, if you are doing uses kind of second follow-up question, if the if you are doing uses uh blinding as a way to kind of discredit of king of king, right? Uh to discredit the, the kind of Romans, uh they do deal with the kind of hot iron trial and all that, right? Especially metropolites and all that is kind of something that's perceived as barbaric western that gets introduced at some point, maybe something to in, in Byzantium. So what's What's your take on that kind of the flip point of how they use the other form of punishment in a way to depict the Westerners as, as these kind of, you know, treacherous barbarians or whatever you will. Great, thank you, Alex. Yeah, um, in terms of the Byzantine reception, I'm glad you bring that up because in fact, yeah, as you insinuate, many of the Byzantine authors were writing about these same events, Poniatis, for instance, above all, uh, pretty often present 
these figures in, in a similar light, right? I mean, it, it's not like it's stupid at all. And so this is another aspect of my uh, my research that I was describing, which is to engage with the notion that it is somehow accepted or unproblematic in society. There's a long tradition of critiques of library as being an excess of imperial power, as being an unjust, uh, in Byzantine culture that, that exists and develops side by side with this tradition of Byzantine library. And in fact, if I could just go back here to, um, I'm going to pull back up this, this graph here on the screen, right? As you see, it exists in these sort of peaks and valleys. And the valleys part of this often come after moments of particularly uh, controversial blindings. So the blinding uh, by the you know, Empress Irene of the Sun Constitution the States, for instance, leads, in, we're looking now, I'm not exactly sure where it's up on this graph, um, but it leads to a, an abandonment of the practice of the years or so. It's like really draw back from it. And it becomes kind of a third rail, and they often experiment with other ways to debilitate their enemies, castration especially, right? But they, they explicitly do not lie, even though there was a ton of it going on in the century before. So there really is a risky endeavor, right? Uh, emperors will do this, but then in terms of um, controlling public perception of it, it's always a gamble to see whether to actually kind of, um, justify it in a way that, that legitimizes it, right? Or whether, or, or, or whether their enemies can kind of undermine it. And so many of these Byzantine authors who are writing in the late 13th, uh, late 12th and early 13th century are attacking the imperial blinding. So Hoyate is, you know, um, really every blinding emperor in his history is a bad emperor. And in fact, uh, he praises the wicked Alexios here, even though Alexios is depicted as kind of the blinder par excellence in Western sources. In Byzantine sources, uh, he actually doesn't do very much blinding. And in fact, this is something Hoyate praises him for. He said he was a really crappy emperor. But you know, at least he didn't blind her. That's actually the only good thing he has to say about it. Um, so, so there's really this negative discourse of blind system uh, in this age as well. And, and it often kind of goes, you mentioned Catholic marriage, right? It will sometimes go uh, case by case, right? We can't, we can't expect consistency in these lives. Catholic marriage is very negative about these blindings that are taken, undertaken by some emperors, and talking about them in other cases, right? as is uh, a couple of with Michael. As you know very well. Um, so the second question was about high higher. Uh, so yeah, there is there's very much a report, the same rhetoric I was talking about, the rhetoric, the rhetoric of the difference that one sees being stoked by the crusades, even as these cultures are becoming kind of on the ground, much more close, there becomes a sort of tightening rhetoric of difference. Right? Um, and that exists, that cut kind of both ways, goes both for the same and for um and for the West, even as there are times when it seems like these cultures are growing. So the, you do have you know, strong fly iron that exists in the Byzantine world. And it, it's around this time, so we're talking about the mid-1200s or so, that Byzantine sources become explicit about how people are using hot irons for blinding. They're not using it, it becomes a kind of different strategy by, by burning, not to get too detailed here, uh, but burning instead of judge. So actually, I, I wondered myself if the use of heated irons is responding to this kind of introduction of hot iron trials by a you know, kind of trials. Yeah, that is, that's actually fascinating because that's what the medieval Serbs do later, or the others in the Balkans don't. But the others stop here. They mention the poem, no? like burning iron to blind eyes. That was just one of them. But anyhow, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's also a lot of that's, that's a mnemonic of the 14th century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah which, which again is coming at this period, which is mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. yeah. It's like a uh, medium expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to go beyond that. Well, it's not happening. It's really horrible. What's description of blind? If you ever want to, uh, you know, not eat for a couple of days, just use that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really awful, but it, it's pretty clear that they're also not heating this iron beforehand. Uh, the emperor probably dies of infection afterwards, mm -hmm. it's a result that we would not be cauterized. the Crusade of the Latin West response to Byzantine blinding. Sort of on the flip side, have you ever, have you encountered any Byzantine responses to this sort of practice in the West? Did they ever see the Crusaders practicing blinding, but they ever react to it in any way that we know of? Yeah, so I don't know of any Byzantine critiques of what you're doing blinding, but they often are, there are some responses to the West that are colored by their understanding of um, Byzantine politics in the time. And the best example of this I can think of is the, the Chronicle of Theophanes the Confessor, who is writing um, 
it, it's a complicated question, but let's just say there's the, the early ninth century. Um, we can we can kind of put him there. Um, and he is coming at this period that I, I mentioned of my reading of uh, five years I read of her son. He's coming at this period after that, a period where blinding is really fallen into disrepute. And so in his chronicle, very much. Um, and so in order, when he presents in his, in his chronicle, Irene's blinding of her son, Constantine, he then juxtaposes this with a account in the West of uh, the attempted blinding of the Pope that takes place around the year 800. Uh, the Pope then ends up fleeing to Charlemagne, Charlemagne comes into Italy, and this results in the crowned Roman Emperor. And in fact, the office uses the title Roman Emperor to refer to Charlemagne here. And so you have this juxtaposition of these two events, which actually take place at different times. But the opening says they occur at the same time. And it's a way of almost showing, uh, in my interpretation of this of it, how much uh, more just Charlemagne is than contemporary Byzantine rulers. It's a way of chastising Byzantine rulers of the day. Because he said, well, you know, Charlemagne was actually not benching these, these blindings, whereas our rulers are perpetuating them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he very markedly refuses to call an Irene Empress, or you know, refuses to use the imperial title in relation to her, and he uses it for Charlemagne. So there was that, that way of using the West as a sort of counterpart, as it were, to the Byzantines. Fascinating, thank you. Uh, thank you again for a very, very uh, interesting talk. And uh, I'm connecting and I'm thinking uh, how the body becomes also uh, an important site for direct control and information of political identities through the blinding. I'm interested in the archaeological references, uh, what, what proof there is that you mentioned in the beginning, but also if we were to think about theory in contemporary times, the continuity of blinding to any case studies uh, that we can see, and how disability theorists, such as Pua, and uh, his, his work, The Right to Live, inform your work and approach as you examine the theory. Yeah. Um, the first thing that question is about continuities. So modern continuities that we can trace back to you know, or you know the earlier blindings. Um, you know, that's that's a that's a very interesting question, actually. I'm not aware of any kind of modern examples of blinding that, that can I or I rather I guess I hesitate to sort of put any sort of modern example into this modern genealogy that, that privileges it as a sort of inheritance from. Um, from a distant past. You know, there is an argument that's often made in Byzantine blinding inherited from this very long Persian tradition, they get from the Sasanians, who um, in turn inherited from the, the Achaemenids. And so in this sort of unitary vision, right, there's always there's sort of one herb blinding that then gets picked up off you know, in the Orient and then spread in this sort of timeless way. So that, that's often where I think of that. Um, but it, it's an interesting question, actually. It's that, uh, worth, worth considering more. Uh, but in, in terms of the I mean, it points the way to some really salutary directions that medieval disability studies can go. Now, I found that the vast majority of medieval disability studies, I really been really talking about this a little bit yesterday, uh, medieval disability studies are really invested in um, refuting the idea of disability as a, um, a kind of objective lack, and instead highlighting the historical constructiveness of this concept, right? There is nothing objective, objectively lacking, let's say, about blindness, right? And if we wanted to get treat this symptom, there is this entire positive tradition. Through Homer and Tiresias, a blinding is actually, you gain something with blindness. You gain a sort of psyche on sight, gain a of right? Um, this is incredibly important work. And it's, it's work that I think a lot of uh, disability theorists, people like Patricia Skinner, have done really well. Um, but I think that we can move beyond that even. And where I see modern disability theory is helping us move beyond that is thinking, okay, once we internalize the understanding of disability as being a construct, can we also ask how constructed ideas of ability and disability are harnessed in, in a context of society in order to maintain systems of control? And this is what you are doing in terms of, uh, and Julie Lindsay as well. In terms of thinking about um, 
modern examples, you know, Livingston talks about miners in Botswana and how modern in modern day Botswana, many miners are um, working in And so it kind of perpetuates this cycle of dependence. Um, now, we're, we're getting pretty far from the idea here, but at least to think about uh, the ways in which certain ideas about uh, how you move through the world, how you use your body, both politically, culturally, socially, inform the ways that, that, that the body is punished and the body is, um, is manipulated as a word control. To give one just more concrete example, um, in late antiquity, before uh, blinding, the most common form of mutilation is handcuff, often the right hand. Uh, and now this, of course, both really for warriors, I mean, you certainly hold the sword. Um, but it also, interestingly, resonates with a whole series of big statues you see of bureaucrats holding pots in their right hand. You think in this kind of bureaucratic society, writing is incredibly important if you're holding high status positions, such that to actually eliminate the power of writing, sometimes a couple of hands is cut off with just the first three fingers. Um, you, you really control the capacities of the individual to participate in the types of, with or, you know, in the kind of bodily regimes that structure power in that society, right? So it's just a little bit more about the post blinding life of the blind. Um, I mean, from antiquity, we have Tiresias, we have um, Samson in the Hebrew Bible. Um, we have spiritual blindness talked about in the New Testament. But um, I kind of wonder about, let's just call him Alexios. <laughs> How does he manage as a blind man? And, and, and does he become a Tiresias figure or? Okay, that's a fantastic question. Um, and something that I'd be really fascinated to hear the answer to. Alexios himself, actually, you know, Brown, Juan Alexios, doesn't, doesn't make it very far. He's, he sort of wanders around blind, and the crusaders actually pick him up, and then they kill him by tossing toss him off a column in other animals. So right? it's, it's, a, it's a pretty bad day. Um, but, but the larger question you asked about the wider lives of these individuals, so they often will disappear from our sources. Um, with Arganius Turkos, who's blinded and you know, ends up in a monastery to keep himself out. And so one has to imagine that there is an entire support infrastructure there because it's not, it's in his, in his helpful that they're taking care of him. Um, we know from Anna Cornelia, she talks about the blinding of a, a figure named Nikiforos Diosides, um, who eventually has a sort of second career as a philosopher. Uh, and because he dictates, he has all of his secretaries who are there, and he's dictating his works. So he actually wrote works after his blinding, uh, which no longer survived. But it's a really interesting little peek into kind of both of the, the potential afterlives and the ways you can still exercise influence as a blind person. To speak a little bit more statistically based, what I found in my work, and it, it's always really difficult and tricky to work with these numbers because you know, we're at the, the mercy of some of the absences of our sources. Um, what it seems like, though, you know, I mentioned in Alex's question the use of heated irons. Once there was a more widespread use of heated irons in line rather than unheated irons, so that the mechanism of destruction of sight becomes more of a kind of burning than a gouging, it seems like the survival rate. Of victims of blinding increase, they get much longer, right? Because if, if, you, if you, it makes sense to us, you know, that you would do it, uh, if you were to sort of gouge out someone's eyes, we're talking about the religious here, chances of infection are just, and, and that's it, that's the first place we you. Um, and there's an understanding among Byzantine authors as well that this would be the case, that you have a greater chance of surviving if, if your blind is done with a heat iron or with, whether it's cauterized very soon after. So with Michael Atelier, if he's talking about, uh, the blinding of the Emperor of Romanos IV. He says the blinding was done in a way to make it more likely that he was going to die. And this was done both by not giving the iron, by giving it to, he claims, a Jew, or Jews are often 
got identified as the agent supplier, and you who is untrained in this sort of thing, which also suggests that there are trained writers that are giving message to strategy, but it's some sort of knowledge because given to an untrained writer. And so really it was a way, it was a stopping horse for execution. They knew he was going to die. And they did it in a way that they should have been Whereas if they had EBI, um, there's a like you know higher likelihood that they that he would survive. And in fact, we do see people sometimes reappear years and years after their findings. If they're blinded with a hot iron, um, in other capacities, this provide more. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So the moil wouldn't freelance. Is that, uh, uh, not well, actually, I mean, probably physicians. Probably physicians. Uh, in in particular, that case with the Vermont Court, it's done in words. And a Jewish physician that had the retinue renewal, they've been the closest thing to the professional binder that was a hand. This is a bit more of a narrow question. So it's a very kind of Canon law question. And so it, it, there are Canon lawyers who deal with this, these questions from a marriage perspective in terms of who counts as your kid. And so actually, in at this time when the Visiting Aristocracy is, is, is proliferating and with all of the intermarriages, you have a text by the patriarch, the Home of Sicilians, which is this text from around the year 1000 or so, argues that you, you can't marry people within the, the um, sixth level of kind of you know, one relationship to you or seven through marriage, right? So there, there's all of this kind of, or I think it's seven, but it, it gets very, very complicated, but they, they really do kind of angels on the head of the little kind of thing. Um, but from a rhetorical standpoint, it's very young in both in the West and the East, right? I mean, is, is your cousin a close kinsman or is he, you know, is it okay? Um, and even the ways in which, you know, if you look closely enough, and Leonor Nevels is like another great book that's in history. If you look closely at even before the Khomeini, everybody, right? I mean, we're dealing with a relatively small world in the West as in the East. Um, and so, in some ways, kind of claims towards kinship, like, isn't this person so terrible? Look at how they're blind with their cousin. Um, there's a kind of rhetoric that's activated if you want to delegitimize that act, which can be sort of quietly subverted if you don't want to. Because the chances are, even though we can't necessarily point to it, in let's say the eighth century, chances are people finding each other are also good cousins there too. Um, become, that's not to say that there's not something fundamentally different in this coming period after 1100. But just that you know, there is very much a rhetorical kind of element to these claims or gestures towards kinship to either legitimize or delegitimize high school. Um, uh, um, so I just want to say. of um, large scale um, blinding, regardless of it's on higher class or although I expect it to be more on lower class victims, um, when it's used and then the reception of it uh, as well, specifically within the Byzantine side. Thank you. I was waiting for Basil to say it. Basil is a really interesting case because he is pretty unique. In this history, as far as I found, in terms of mass blindness, there are three that take place from the Basil's reign. The famous one is um, actually the one that gets the variant, but he does it twice more on the eastern frontier as had Georgians and Armenians as well. So this is actually a pattern in his reign, and it often takes place in periods where you know he's, he's bogged down in his sort of quagmire wars, right? Um, and, and often it's in favor of losing. And so this, there's a, a practical element there in these past findings that takes place in the past, um, where I mean, if you think of what it means to blind, you know, he's, he's said to blind 15,000 people, whether or not they accept that number, they probably shouldn't. It, it's just a, a standard for a lot of people. He's blinding a lot of people, and the leading of their back to the areas, there's a whole kind of, the resources that are consumed by these people, right? The kind of care that they've given to them. Um, it's a real military kind of dream. So there's, there's a military strategic angle to this. Um, our Byzantine sources are strangely mum in terms of either condemning or justifying these acts. Stanisius, who's one of our only sources, 
um, this historian of the late 11th, maybe the very early 12th century, um, it says, um, he, he essentially just says it happens. And uh, you, know, you have also, uh, I think we've taken the North, but I've heard that elsewhere, who also talks about it. Like, but it, it's, it's the state more as a fact and that is kind of condemning. Um, the one thing I will say is that the only other example of mass flying in Byzantine history I found, this isn't including the West, it's much more common than talk about a little bit more kind of mass mutilations of people in the West. But in Byzantium, the only other case of mass flying I found actually takes place in the reign of Constantine the Ninth. And it, it's not preserved in any of our Byzantine sources, it's preserved in the Russian primary chronicle, where the Russians say there's a Russian raid um, on Constantinople in the reign of Constantine the Ninth in the 1040s, early 1050s, uh, and all these prisoners are blinded. And we have no other record than, than this. Uh, I've always wondered if there's a little bit of an like imitatsu of that's, that's going on there, right? It, it, it's kind of striking this pose of great conqueror, and there's already, we already we know that, you know, by this period, people already know about climate has become this kind of thing that's repeated. Uh, and but I wonder if there's a, if that gives us a little bit of a clue into some of the ways that you can use to kind of strike a pose as a great conquering mechanism for some of the memories. But again, that's that's really hypothetical. It's a great question that I'm sure you answer. That's fine. We're talking probably potential for Blu-ray. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And it's fascinating then because there's a new sources which talk about the raid and have opinions about the heroes and all that among yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. It's really, very interesting. And this is part of why, you know, I, I gave a whole list of different languages that I, I, I tried to look at, uh, some of which are original, some of which are translation. But it's often so important to correct our institute resources with, or fill in the gaps, as it were, with some of these other language kind of um, traditions. Because sometimes, you know, the only, the only way we know about Basil's mass flying of uh, Georgian prisoners of war, for instance, is from an Armenian historian from the 12th century. I mean, we have no idea that it's really this source of stuff. And so the, what sources choose to tell us and what they don't is really uh, an interesting question in and of itself, but it can't be assumed that every important act of blinding or even every kind of mass blinding would necessarily be recorded in Byzantine sources. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you again. This was, it was just so fascinating. Um, just thinking about the symbolism of the eyes, do we see differences in symbolism of Eyes, vision, blinding in Byzantium versus the West. We see differences there. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really good question. There is Western translation. The Arabic as well. So there's, there's a similar kind of faith in there. There's also a similar grounding. The Christian Roman Empire and beyond, and classical antiquity, and that big Western effect. And this actually gets back to something that David brought up earlier about Tiresias and Homer. What's really interesting is that you have this tradition of kind of sight beyond sight, spiritual vision that exists in classical antiquity, the idea of the blind prophet as a kind of stock cultural figure, which, as far as I've been able to tell, isn't very prevalent in either the medieval West or the Byzantium. I've never found the life of a blind saint. You know, I, I, I've asked just about every audience I've spoken to, no one's given it to me. If someone knows about a blind saint, please tell me. There are saints who sort of lose their eyes in the course of their martyrdom. But I've never seen a saint who actually is, you know, and as part of their, their suffering, right? But I've never seen a saint who is blind and going around working on miracles. Do you have uh, uh, No, it's uh, often part of the martyrdom, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, the... And so there's, there's, there's a lot of healing of the blind, both in the hagiographies in the West and in Byzantium. And you know, going back into Latin and Greek patristic literature as well, interpretations of biblical sources on blinding miracles. Um, we'll often talk about how blindness exists as a gift from God in order that it can be cured. Right? Um, Christ heals the blind man. Saul goes blind in the road to Damascus, and then his, his, his vision is given back to him and converted to Paul. Right? So it's always part of this kind of miraculous intercession of the blind. The blindness itself is not a gift. It is a gift that allows then you know, the, the, the glory of God to be presented to the mind of the blind person themselves and all of the observers. 
Yeah. And then you have all the kind of spiritual blind, but really negative, just language blindness that exists in the Bible. Pharisees are blind in the eyes of their mind because they refuse to, to acknowledge Christ. So, you know, I don't want to put too much emphasis on this point, but there seems to be a shift in some of the, the valence of sight and blindness from classical antiquity to kind of Christian late antiquity and into the ages in terms of there being a, a, a narrowing of the complexities of, of the kind of valences of blindness in classical antiquity to being a much more negative kind of creation that exists after, I mean, let's say 400. Uh, I just sort of had a question. Um, it seems from you know my my limited experience, it was a great talk by the way. Um, but uh, from my limited experience with um with literature is that uh, this seems to be almost entirely a punishment for for bearded men. This doesn't happen to eunuchs so often or to women. Is that is that uh, can you speak to that at all, or yeah. like, you know sort of what might be kind of happening? Now? Yeah, no, that's, that's a very keen observation. I uh, found no precise example of, of any woman being punished by blindness. Poniates and Miketas Poniates, in the course of discussing all the people, you see this one really big spike in blindness. That's actually going to go to the middle. So yeah. you know, uh, he finds a ton of people. Um, and in this list of all these people, uh, Miketas Poniates says, even why he doesn't name anybody. He doesn't give us any details. He, it's just part of his invective um, where he's sort of keeping all these crimes after crime. And so there's a sense that he made something that's really strange and um, um, accurate, that he even blind with. Um, so that fits generally with the actions we find in other periods of human history where I really haven't found an example. And there are very, very few examples of eunuchs being blind. There, there are some, but it's very rare. Um, in part, you know, I think certainly for the in the Unix for a uh, case, there is a sense that there are real strong prohibitions against Unix that are becoming members. Strong in ways that there aren't necessarily about blinding members. There is a general understanding that it's very difficult to create consensus around your ability to compete the throne if you're blind. But Byzantine authors are much more explicit about saying a unit cannot be emperor. I never had a Byzantine author who says a blind person cannot be emperor. And you do in other cultures have certain categorical statements in Islam, for instance, you have certain categorical statements. The caliph cannot be named. There's nothing like that in the right? You're dealing with the kind of those sort of hard rules. Um, but there are those statements about eunuchs. And so, in, in some ways, you know, maybe it's a cold to castle kind of thing where blind and eunuch is our you I have a small question. I think it's not very uh, relevant, so feel free to ignore it if it isn't. Uh, so we necessarily bound by the sources and what they deem newsworthy and worthy of reporting. So I was just curious about the statistical picture you presented, yeah. where there's a sort of divide between the 11th and the 12th centuries, where there's a lot of like high society being blinded in the 11th, and then reporting is sort of more common as in the 12th century, you said. So my, my question is basically, uh, can the sort of realignment of the Byzantine aristocracy in the Comenian period becoming more tight-knit have affected uh, Byzantine historiography and how this is reported and perhaps changed uh, like who, like how they report who is being blinded and how, and could this have affected the statistical picture? No, that, that's a phenomenal question, right? It's something I've really tried to grapple with in terms of creating this distract, which I, I really do want to say is, is very much a first kind of sketch, right? There are all sorts of reasons why this pattern is really not true. Um, but I think it brings us to something that's closer to truth, and, and statistical questions don't go away because we're just asking, right? The questions of how frequency change over time are still very important. We need to try as best we can with the resources we have to, to answer those questions and take up that challenge. Uh, but you're absolutely right that um, the quality of our sources changes. Now, there, there are two things I want to talk about in that question. The first, um, in terms of the ways that the actual presentation of mind changes in our sources, I've been really struck reading the Alexia and Anna Komenos. So she's the imperial daughter of his emperor Alexios Komenos, um, who writes her father's biography. Uh, and she's writing this under the reign of her great nephew, Manuel Komenos. Um, so she's writing this later in the Komenian period. And actually, there's a good deal of blinding that takes place in Alexios Komenos' early uh, career. So in the, the kind of chaos of the late 1070s, the early 1080s, 
Um, he's involved. It's a really kind of sticky environment that takes place under the course of the with and all of this. And um, at every instance, Anna Comenda is at pains to make clear that, her, that he didn't do it. <laughs> Even though, um, you know, it was done under his watch by his soldiers, you know, uh, it, it wasn't there. It was his underlings who did it without his knowledge, or he made, you know, he was a general and he captured the, the you know, the rebel and sent him over the emperor, and the emperor did it, or it was the emperor's evil eunuch who did it, or it was, you know, all of these kind of, it, it, it's never him. And so it, it really, when you actually look for it, it's pretty striking how every day she has to admit, or it feels like he has that there are these sometimes very committed people in the Yoshi's. Where there are these poor identity, these, these you know, sons of great emperors who get money and run us as chaos. And she she really was going out of the way to decide that Alexios had no idea what they were doing. Um, so there are these development of strategies that take place in this world that's that's emerged from Alexios. There's many of these families, many people who are blinded by Alexios um, are still there, but part of this committee and kind of aristocracy, a way of trying to really cleanse him. Of any of the um, state that may attach itself to him, the kind of body that took place is his sort of uh, the Octavian stage of his Augustus career, uh, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of just actual sources, you know, I can answer that in a wider question of all your sources to change. Um, in my dissertation, I had both this graph and another graph, the devil from TLG, which is the best we can do in terms of thinking about the number of sources that exist, uh, the kind of different sources, the number of different sources that exist. Mm -hmm. By century in the visible world. And what's really interesting is that it bears no relationship to this graph, which is really striking. And I'm still trying to figure out what exactly the significance of it is, which would potentially expect, if indeed it is entirely a function of a certain type of literature or just a function of the presence or absence of literature, the presence or absence of climate, that we might find really close kind of uh, patterns that exist in relation to that. And that doesn't seem to be the case, which suggests to me that the general sketch. Of this, these kind of bars up here isn't just a mirage of sources. There could be other things that are coming into play, but it, it's not entirely a, 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 you know, a, a product of, kind of what exists rather than what, what's there to be found. Question uh, of audience. Uh -huh. um, uh, in, a, in a way, then, the personal activity. Blinding because just uh, grabbing someone during dinner and slapping uh, his eyes off uh, on your carpet uh, at home doesn't have the big audience. But Conflict in the Fifth, uh, from what I remember, he often said, I don't keep blinds at the people wrong, but he punishes at the people wrong in front of thousands of people, um, which basically uh, raised the question of popular uh, acceptance of this because he wouldn't be doing it, I assume, if. These thousands of people were going to riot. So, can we talk about audiences? I could give a whole second talk on this. In fact, that was when I was thinking about what topic I was going to discuss. It's either this one or, or that. that. Uh, so, I'm, I'm glad it's come up. Um, so, Constantine the Fifth, as you say, lines at the time. To sketch and answer this question. We can say before continuity of this, so before right 800 or so, bindings almost always take place in the future, in the great force rings, racing stadium of Constantinople, often with, we, you know, with crowds and children bands in ways that are attempting to bring as much visibility as possible to this event. They're taking place before the horse races begin because it's going to be part of the stage, but it's after the horse races. So it's being timed in this way and being kind of ringed around by all of these acclamations we have. Evidence for all the ways in which Constantine V reads out um, the, the sentence of blinding against the, these rebels in the Hippodrome and the Dean's chant. They, they, they burn to jump. Beneath, beneath dirt, you know, they're on donkey, they get the sackcloth, they have their hair shaved, there's you know, the feces, right? So the mining is part of this huge kind of unmaking of these, these you know, aristocrats, um, which is very deeply kind of humiliating and exposes them to the lack of the crowd. So it's all about visibility. After, after the blinding of, of Constantine VI, but after about, let's say, the year 800, that disappears. And what we see instead is that blinding takes place 
at night in monasteries, hidden away from the view, way outside. Right? Um, what I argue in, in, in my wider work is that um, this is actually a, a result of the turning of popular opinion against one another. So that you have a series of very controversial bodies that take place at the end of the 1700s, early 1800s, of which Iranians are one of. Uh, and it brings body into this repeat. So these moments of kind of withdrawing from line, they're all in different strategies that emerge um, in order to kind of create distance between the emperor, the distance that really exists in classical antiquity or under the historians between the emperor and the actual punishment. You know, Anna Kamina is a great example of this, how she rhetorically creates distance in between um, her, her father and these events. Uh, and then here, you know, uh, Nika Poros I is one of these emperors who reigns um, from 802 to 811, who does the body, but his bodies take place, you know, they're, they're happening a few decades after these very different spectacles of custody. The fifth, but they're happening hidden away from the world. And when there's public outcry about his blindness, he essentially does the Alexios of Animal Singh. He says, It wasn't me. And he, he, he goes before the Senate. He probably he's pretty clear. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And he cries, and he, he often is our, our source for says that he, he you know, withdraws into the chamber and he cries for seven days. Uh, and he said, These were the crocodiles, you know, this, but our, our source there is very critical. Uh, but it's a totally different response. So there's a kind of gamble. It's always taking place when you decide to live in public. Yeah, and this gets back to the kind of Foucauldian spectacle of the scaffold, right? Um, when you decide to do this punishment in public, it can be really um, reaffirming, but you also lose a degree of control about it. You roll the dice, you're hoping that, you, that your intended, uh, the way that you want it to be received is how the crowds are actually going to receive it. And that's never certain. So, in some ways, seeing when and how Byzantine emperors decide to be. Been sent to it publicly or not is something of an index of how secure they think they are and how um, how willing they are to take the gamble on a public response. And one last thing to that, you know, Alexios, uh, I, I mentioned him as well in, in the Alexia. The one time that Anacom Meta talks about him kind of embracing blinding is this rebellion that takes place during the 1100s, uh, not only Michael Penabos, who's being paraded. Um, in this kind of upside down trial, the streets of Constantinople, people are throwing things, they're, they're jeering him, and it's publicly announced that he's going to be blinded. And uh, the entire mood of the crowd, according to him, it changes. And people suddenly become, it's a very Foucauldian moment where people suddenly uh, have a lot of sympathy for this general. They see how bravely, this is Anna's words, they see how bravely he's enduring his punishments, and you know, they remember his services to the Respublica, and, and suddenly the mood of the crowd changes. And Anna claims that she herself goes to her father and tells him the mood of the crowd has changed. And then she publicly says, okay, no, no point. It's not like that. Um, so you see, you see how it acts with the crowd. Um, you can lose control very easily. And I mean, it's not something that then would be interesting because it would be interesting to see if you can find this with him having defeated Arabs or the Bayans. But then all these lines would be over safe. Yeah, no, it, it does very well. Right. The genes are, are big parts both in the crime of the ceremony against the Bulgarians and against Arab and in his suppression of the rebels. Yeah, so willing to join uh, to, to beer craft for uh, some snacks and uh, and chat so there's opportunity to keep the conversation going but maybe let's move it to a more informal um, uh, setting um uh, thank you uh, very much for for this this was a great way to begin uh, uh to begin the the season glasses may be changed not um, and uh uh, before uh, we begin, I'd also uh, like to thank all of you for being here, our audience uh, uh, online, and just uh, alert you to the fact that uh, next Friday, September 23rd, same time, uh, Meadows uh, will be uh, presenting uh, uh, his uh, uh, work on uh, Paphlagonia, specifically uh, the topic titled Communication and Movement Dynamics in Byzantine uh, Paphlagonia. Looking forward to uh, uh, to uh, to that, and I would also like to alert you the fact that uh, uh, we are coming closer to our sixth annual uh, Edward and Emily McQueen Memorial Lecture, uh, featuring uh, the Gladstone Professor of uh, Government, 
Stathis uh, Kalimas from the uh, University of Oxford. His talk is titled How Democracies Survive uh, Greece from uh, 2012 uh, 2022. Uh, 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 and Mr. Uh, uh, Kalimas will be basically surveying uh, Greek political scene and uh, the factors that led uh, to stability uh, in Greece and to, uh, perhaps the bolstering of Greek democracy after uh, what was a pretty a big shock uh, to the whole political system. Um, to register for uh, either of these events, uh, please go to our website, uh, sq.ca, Hellenic Studies, or email uh, hscom at uh, sq.ca. Uh, please do, if you are uh, we, uh, going to participate, uh, register. The headcount really helps us plan things. Uh, once again, thanks everyone for being here. And, uh,